So the topic uh, for today is how to disclose or sell an exploit without getting in trouble. Uh, I'm Jim DeNaro. I'm an intellectual property attorney based out of Washington, D.C. I focus my work uh, exclusively on information security technologies. Uh, before I went to, to, to law school, um, I used to spend uh, far too much time just tweaking around on, um, on Maxbug uh, on my PowerPC and um, figured that no better way to, to, to keep doing that than to do this. And so here we go. Um, just because I'm an attorney and this does have some legal component to it, although this is not a law talk uh, really, I have to give the standard disclaimer that this uh, presentation is not legal advice about uh, your specific situation or your specific questions. Even if you ask me a question, we're still talking about hypotheticals. If we develop an attorney-client relationship, um, then we're talking about your specific problem and giving specific legal advice. So this presentation does not create an attorney-client relationship alone. Um, we can maybe do that. Um, do that later. Uh, so just as, as a quick overview of uh, what we're trying to accomplish here in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to speak quickly to make sure we get it, get it all in. We're going to cover the types of risks uh, that are, are being faced by researchers, some risk mitigation strategies that researchers can, can take to try to reduce those risks, um, some of your options for disclosing a vulnerability that may be less that may have less risk, uh, and then some of the risks that are associated with uh, selling an, an exploit. Uh, the overall goal of this is to make yourself a harder target. If someone ever asks you, well, can I be sued if, this, if I do this or if this happens, the answer is always yes. Okay? You can always be sued by anybody for anything at any time. The only question is, who's going to win? And the goal is to make it more likely that you will win, which disincentivizes someone from actually suing you in the first place. <clears throat> so let's start out with just some great examples of the kind of uh, research activities that might get somebody in trouble. For example, some of these, these are generally real life cases. Um, you found out how to see other people's utility bills by changing the HTTP query string. I talked to someone at a party the other night who had done just exactly that. He was wondering what to do about it. Uh, you discover your neighbor's Wi-Fi is not protected. How did you find that out? Um, you broke the crypto that's protecting some media that you had. It's getting a little more serious now. There's actual money at stake. And maybe you, both, you, you wrote a better remote access tool. That sounds like you might make a lot of money. Uh, so many of the same risks apply, surprisingly enough, uh, whether you're just um, you know, looking at changing uh, HTTP strings or whether you're actually uh, you know, taking apart a DVD. So in general, we're talking about techniques. I've sort of defined it here, um, broad spectrum, everything from uh, denial of service, uh, a technique that might be used for a denial of service attack to something that's um, just you know, more akin to sort of investigatory web browsing. Okay, first, when is there risk to a security researcher? There are three general areas where we see the risk, the risk starting to show up. One, there can be a threat of legal action before you go to a conference or make this disclosure. There are some examples listed here. Um, you might be the recipient of a, um, of a legal action seeking an injunction barring you from disclosing something before a conference. So we now remove from merely saber rattling to an actual lawsuit being filed against you. And then there's the possibility of a legal action being uh, initiated uh, against you after you make the disclosure. And these are all real examples. Uh, you can, Declan McCulloch of uh, CNET and his colleagues have written some very interesting articles that go into more detail about some of these cases. I would recommend them to you uh, most definitely. Um, but you might notice that some of these seem to be around Black Hat and DEF CON. <laughs> <laughs> on a pretty regular basis. Um, so that, that's when it can happen. Your number one concern is typically going to be the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. You've probably heard a lot about that lately, uh, perhaps here at other conferences. Um, the, the, the main issue is that it prohibits access without authorization or exceeding authorized access. Uh, the two times when you're likely to, to run into possibly exceeding authorized access uh, or acting without authorization um, would be in the investigatory phase of working on your, um, on whatever technique it is that, you're, that, you're, that you've got. Um, and 
when you actually create a tool that performs whatever this technique is, you might actually um, have a problem where that tool does the act that is, that is prohibited. So in light of, you know, every, everyone's talked much about how vague uh, this, this notion of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is of authorization. I've created a handy checklist to figure out if, if you, you might have a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act problem. So there we go. <laughs> Are you connected to the internet? Probably. Are you accessing a remote system? Probably. Do you have permission to access that system? This is the real hard question. Um, it's really hard to know if you have permission. If you saw a banner go by that said you don't have access, you probably don't have access. Uh, but there are a lot of cases where it's, it's not so clear. And uh, that's, that's really where, where, where you have this sort of like the, uh, the Andrew Ornheimer situation where he's querying a public facing API on a repeated basis. No one asked him to do that. but. There was no banner. There was no clear prohibition of doing that. It was a public-facing API, after all. Uh, so there's really there is some real risk in figuring out if you can whether or not you have permission. But that's really all it. That's really all it takes. Uh, unfortunately, it's not just about what you do. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is about what your friends do. Uh, and I believe the risk of, of being caught up in conspiracy to violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is most certainly enhanced by the prevalence of social media today. Uh, so if you're on Twitter or some other easy, very easy to use social media platform, you're talking to your friends about how you might do something or answering questions uh, about how you might do a certain thing uh, with a technique that you've developed, um, you're starting to head down the road of conspiracy. Uh, conspiracy typically does require uh, an overt act uh, to, in order to uh, really fulfill the conspiracy and, and typically just discussing something with someone is not. Uh, but if you start providing technical support, uh, for, for something that someone else is doing, um, you're really definitely increasing the risk um, of being caught up in a conspiracy to violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act if not actually violating yourself. Um, so we've got some examples here uh, where the um, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act has been applied. I think it's helpful to look at some examples because <coughs> That's how we see how it's being applied. And we can compare what we're doing to some of the things that have happened in the past to other people and see how close, how, how close those comparisons are. And since we're in Las Vegas, we absolutely have to talk about the case of Nestor. Uh, Nestor was really into uh, video poker. And he liked to play and play and play and play. And he got really good at it. And he played it so much that he discovered a bug in the video poker software that enabled him to play one type of game and bid up a bunch, bid a bunch of money into that game and then switch to a different game and a multiplier would be applied to his bid. Uh, so when he won, he got this enormous payout. And he figured out how to reproduce this bug very efficiently. So he was doing it and his friends were doing it and they were getting a lot of money. And obviously eventually, how these stories always end, he gets caught. And uh, he was charged with, amongst other frauds, violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And as we were just looking at the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act a few moments ago, we saw it's really mostly about unauthorized access or exceeding an authorized authorization that you had and it's hard to imagine how sitting, he didn't access the firmware, he didn't take the game apart, he just sat there putting money in and pushing the buttons on the surface of the machine. How you could exceed authorized access to a video poker machine is absolutely mind boggling. Um, but nonetheless those charges were levied against him. Ultimately the Department of Justice did not pursue those charges. Those charges were dropped. They went ahead with other fraud charges. But nonetheless, uh, for some period of time, he was facing computer fraud and abuse charges for doing exactly that. Um, it's also worth looking at um, the, the tragic case of Aaron Swartz who uh, spoofed his MAC address to download journal articles. That was uh, computer fraud and abuse act crime. Uh, Andrew Orenheimer who allegedly conspired to run an automated script to uh, plug in identifiers for iPads and get email addresses. Um, didn't even do it himself. Um, he's doing several years in federal prison for that. Uh, also worth noting that the <coughs> Department of Justice has said in their manual about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that conspiracy to hack a honeypot 
can violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, there's really no end to the, the sorts of things that could possibly violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, so you're looking at a situation where the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act almost acts as an ex post facto law where the Department of Justice is able to look at what you did after the fact and if they don't like it or they don't like you for whatever reason, um, you may be trollish for some reason, um, you are likely to be on the wrong end of, um, of a computer front abuse act prosecution. There's also a civil uh, cause of action provided by the Com Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So the company that uh, whoever the target is of this um, exploit uh, can also pursue uh, who's ever uh, accessed the system without authorization. So the question then is what can we, is there anything we can do um, to try to reduce our chances of being on the wrong end of this type of lawsuit? Um, well, Let's take a quick, we don't want to go too far in the statute. Uh, it's not a continuing legal education conference. But let's just take a quick look at the statute and see if there's some key words we can, we can at least identify. Um, here we have whoever having knowingly access to computer without authorization. Another part of the statute, whoever intentionally accesses a computer without authorization. So one of the things you can do is to try to avoid unintentionally creating knowledge and intent. Um, it's a little bit hard to do this for, for yourself if you intend to do something, um, but at least it's, you can avoid doing it um, in connection with other people. Um, so, for example, I would suggest that you do not direct information about how to use some kind of technique uh, to someone that you suspect or have reason to know is likely to use it illegally. Um, be careful in providing technical support uh, for some clever new technique that you've developed. Uh, so my advice, uh, if I were your lawyer, I would advise you not to answer that tweet. Uh, when, when if, you, if, if someone's uh, tweeting to you asking you about how to, um, how to make something more effective perhaps. This slides a little more detailed, some more, um, some more uh, approaches that you might take. Um, don't provide information possibly directly to individuals, um, especially if you're not sure who they are or what they might be up to. Consider just posting things uh, on, on a website uh, only. Uh, do not post information to forums uh, where you suspect uh, or you um, or forms that are known to generally promote illegal activity. Um, if you publish it on your own website or you have control of the post, consider disabling comments uh, so you don't have a situation of people discussing potentially illegal act illegal uses of um, of your technique. And lastly, don't maintain logs. Um, <laughs> So one of the things we've seen happen, so that, that's enough for the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for now. Um, there's not a whole lot you can really do about it beyond um, just being, being careful. Um, let's move on to the, a temporary restraining order. Um, this is particularly timely actually because you may have read the, uh, the story about uh, the VW Group uh, and the, and the Megamos uh, encryption that was used on the vehicle immobilizers. So some European security researchers had figured out how to bypass the or, or discovered a flaw in the encryption that was used on the vehicle immobilizers that were used in VW Group cars like Porsche and Audi and, and uh, Bentley. And uh, they were going to present this at the USENIX conference in Washington DC in a few weeks. And and uh, they got uh, themselves slapped with a temporary restraining order preventing them from making this disclosure at the conference. Um, how did this happen and how, and how can we prevent this from happening again? Uh, we've seen this here at, at DEF CON and, and Black Hat. The talks have been uh, stopped by a temporary restraining order. So take a quick look at the, at the factors uh, that the courts look at when deciding whether or not to grant a temporary restraining order to prevent a, a researcher from disclosing some information about a vulnerability. Number one. Will the requester, so in this, that case it would be the VW group, suffer irreparable harm if the TRO does not issue? <laughs> Good evening, sir. Okay, who knows how this works? <laughs> Is he a new speaker? Yes. All right, it's really hard to get accepted to speak at DIFCON, right? You guys should all be thinking about how you're going to create speaks, talks. I've been drinking all day. Uh, <laughs> Uh, talks to uh, eventually have yourselves up here, right? A big round of applause for Jim. All 
All right, one more order of business. We need a new person who's first time at DEF CON. First hand up right there. Red shirt, come on up on the stage. We've got a little extra. Let's get one more. Are we, are we going to get two people? All right, first hand up over there. There we go. There, it, there you go. <laughs> All right, cheers to our new speaker. Hang on. Hang on. Ah. All right, let's see if you can pick up where he left off. We're going to work on new material for next for tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, so that was great. Thank you. Uh, so, all right, just a quick look at some of the factors that the court's going to look at when deciding whether or not to grant a temporary restraining order to some, someone like the, the VW group who wants to stop a presentation from happening at Usenix. Uh, will the requester, the VW group, suffer irreparable harm if the TRO does not issue? Pretty easy to imagine. You've got an embedded system and someone's figured out how to break it. It's going to be almost impossible for them to update it in any reasonable amount of time. It's usually expensive, um, probably some irre irreparable harm. That basically means that money isn't going to fix it very easily. Uh, so that goes in VW Group's favor. Will there be an even greater harm to the researcher if the TRO does not issue? What, your paper got delayed? Uh, you couldn't put in some part of the algorithm maybe? You had to pare it back? Um, hard to see that as like a huge harm to the researcher. We might feel really bad about that. Uh, but in terms of the huge sums of money VW Group's going to have to pay to fix this, um, it's not really going to look too good in the, uh, for, for the researcher there. The public interest? This is kind of a fun one because we might think that, well, the public interest clearly favors disclosing the vulnerability so it can be fixed. Um, the court's probably going to go the other way on that uh, and, and see that um, really the, the, the risk to all these BMWs or rather, uh, you know, Porsches and, and Bentleys and, and things being stolen is much greater, uh, is much more in the public interest than, than having, uh, you know, your, your really obscure crypto talk go forward. Um, the last, the last, it ta the last uh, factor is the likelihood a requester will ultimately prevail. And this is really the one we need to focus on uh, because the VW group has to have a cause of action. Um, they can't just say we don't like it. They have to say, here's why you need to stop. And it's because you did something bad to us. Um, and in, in the case of the VW group, uh, the, the Megamos case, and also in, a, uh, in the case of the, uh, the, Cisco, uh, the Cisco disclosure, um, what we had was the use of copyrighted material. And that's really what, that was the hook uh, that got the TRO to issue. Um, so the obvious advice then is to avoid the use of copyrighted material. So if you include source code or object code from whatever it is that you're, you're working on, um, that gives leverage to whoever it is that wants to stop you from, from disclosing it. Um, there is a fair use exception if you use little bits and pieces of code. Uh, but that's, that's a case by case analysis and you can't just say, well, this is going to be fair use. It depends on how much you use and, 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 other, and other factors that, that are very specific to what's actually going on in, in your case. So um, just tr try to avoid it if you can. It may not be possible, uh, but uh, to the extent you can, do that. Um, also avoid darknet sources for wherever you're getting this stuff. Uh, in the Megamos case, the court actually talked about the fact that the researchers obtained uh, some information about uh, how the Megamos system worked through some sketchy channels. I don't know, I don't recall it saying exactly where they got it, but it was some sort of BitTorrent P2P type thing wherever they got it. It wasn't, it wasn't from uh, VW Group or, or Megamos. Um, so another thing you want to do is be aware of pre-existing contractual relationships that you as a security researcher might have with the target of whatever it is you're working on. Um, these contractual agreements could come in the form of a term of service, uh, end user license agreements, non-disclosure agreements, or employment agreements. So, what's that? Sure. So an end user license agreement might very well have uh, provisions in it that prohibit reverse engineering software, for example. 
and that's something that you might very well be doing as part of your exploration into your technique, uh, and that would that could give leverage uh, to someone to try to stop you, saying, "Oh, you've you've breached this." Um, you know, nothing's for certain. It's just an argument that they have. It's something. There's not much you can do about it. I mean, you ever pretty much every piece of software you get is going to have some kind of license agreement that's going to. Assuming you came to it legitimately, right? You've agreed to this this uh, license that may prohibit you from doing certain things with that software and there's not a whole lot you can do about that. Um, but you at least can be aware of the risk uh, if nothing else. Um, so how far you need to go in trying to mitigate the risk somewhat depends on the techniques that, that you've used in your research. If you've done things that are clearly, that clearly look like some of the examples of uh, you know, what people have done that's gotten them uh, prison time, that's something you need to, be, you need to be careful of and maybe take more aggressive uh, mitigation uh, techniques in order to perhaps hide some of the information about what you're doing. So for example, if in the, um, the Megamos case, no one had identified uh, that it was the VW group that was uh, where, the, where this crypto system had been compromised, VW Group would not have been able to issue uh, to go after uh, a temporary restraining order uh, against, the, against the researchers. So perhaps there's an opportunity here for the conference going community to create uh, a track where people could present things that are to sort of get like a little asterisk or something next to it and, and we all recognize that this is something that had to be kept quiet. It's sort of like a confidential disclosure, trust the review board, this is going to be really cool but we just can't really tell you about what it is because then you won't get to hear it. Uh, so maybe, maybe that's, that's one approach. So I'd like to talk about some of the ways that you might make a disclosure that are relatively less likely to um, get you in trouble. Um, you can obviously disclose to the responsible party. That's what we'd like to do. That's sort of what the responsible disclosure uh, paradigm is all about. You found a problem with the system, you tell who's running the system. Um, this is actually, unfortunately, relatively high risk uh, and that risk scales with the <coughs> questionableness of whatever technique it was uh, that, that you used to find out about this vulnerability. So if you were connected to the internet and you accessed a remote system and you didn't have permission, that's how you did it. It may not be a great idea to go tell them about it because if they don't like it, They've got an action against you. If you're inconvenient, that's a problem for you. Um, you might think you're doing a fa them a favor. You might, they might not agree that you're doing them a favor. Um, if you're able to submit it anonymously to whoever the, the vendor is or the responsible party, that's great. Um, depends how good your OPSEC is. I suppose. Um, a lot of times you think you're maybe anonymous but you're not as anonymous as you thought you were or hoped you were. Uh, so that's a risk in itself that you need to consider. Um, if you submit to a bug bounty, presumably they've invited it, uh, maybe, maybe you're, you're at less risk. Um, you can disclose to a government authority perhaps. Uh, maybe you don't really believe it will ever get to the vendor. Uh, but again, if you if your techniques were perhaps questionable, you might not necessarily want to be submitting it to a government, a governmental authority. Um, you may want to separately. You may have an interest in keeping your own identity anonymous. Um, again, you can try to submit anonymously to the government, uh, but I don't know how much we can really trust that anymore. Um, fortunately, you know, this is a legal talk and somewhat legal talk and you can almost never get to a legal talk where someone will actually tell you something for sure. Like absolutely, 100 percent, you will not get in trouble if you do this. Um, but it, fortunately we are in a case here where there is one group of people who really don't have to worry about getting in trouble with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act when they disclose a vulnerability and here they are. You know, okay to disclose if you're one of these people. Um, although she really should not have been hacking the palace computer. We're not going to hold that against her. Um, the, so the, we're, we're thinking about ways that we might be able to um, leverage opportunities for security researchers to uh, make disclosures while keeping the risk as low as possible. So we're working on creating a pilot program where attorney-client privilege 
can be leveraged to hide the identity uh, and the techniques used by a security researcher in making a disclosure. So the concept works like this. The researcher would disclose the vulnerability to a trusted third party, uh, which would be an attorney only to the attorney. Um, it's critical that this be a completely confidential disclosure to maintain that attorney, the confidentiality of, of that um, disclosure so that other entities on the outside can't get to it. Um, the trusted third party does not publish the vulnerability on behalf of the researcher. However, the trusted third party does disclose the vulnerability to whoever the affected party is, whoever has this vulnerability. The researcher, the researcher remains anonymous during the entire process. This is possibly of use if there's no better option. It's a little bit cumbersome and there are some side effects uh, chiefly that the researcher you know, remains anonymous, doesn't get public credit uh, for, what the, for whatever the research was, um, but it is one possible way for the researcher to uh, be able to disclose uh, and remain about as anonymous as one can possibly get. Uh, so this is a pilot program. We're currently working on it. We're sort of kicking out the bugs right now. So if anyone's interested in, in talking to us further about, about this, we definitely welcome your input and please see me, please see me afterwards. Uh, we should now turn to selling very quickly. Right now, there is no law in the U.S. that prohibits the selling of an exploit. Uh, and that is a situation that is probably likely to change in the not too distant future, but for now, there's really not, not too much to worry about unless the techniques, of course, going back a few slides, if your techniques in developing your exploit um, have some problem, then you still have a problem. But the fact of the sale itself is not something that's going to get you in trouble. Um, however, there's, there's a lot of focus on this on this market now and here are some recent articles from May of 2013, booming zero day trade as Washington experts worried and my favorite, the U.S. Senate wants to control malware like it's a missile. Um, <laughs> stuff is dangerous. Um, so every year the Congress has, Congress has to pass the National Defense Authorization Act. It sets the budget for DOD and includes a bunch of other stuff that gets stuck in there. And this year, well, for, for 2014, the Senate version, it hasn't been passed yet, it's still in, uh, in Congress. The Senate version um, has provisions that seek to begin the process of regulating the sale of, um, the sale of exploits. Uh, the bill, of course, the House version doesn't have this. This is still just in the Senate. But you know, I think this is, this is where it's headed. Uh, the, the bill notes that the President shall establish a process uh, for developing policy to control the proliferation of cyber weapons through a whole series of possible actions, right? Export controls, law enforcement, financial, diplomatic engagement, and so on. Uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, that had the bill before it was uh, passed to the um, to the, to the rest of the Senate, sorry, to, yeah, to the rest of the Senate, said um, they had some commentary on this. And they referred to the dangerous software, a global black market, a gray market. Uh, it starts to look really bad. Uh, but they note that there is, we need to have a carve out for dual use software and pen testing tools. Um, in Europe, uh, the European Parliament recently passed a directive. Uh, they're a little bit ahead of us. This prohibition on the sale of, of tools, as they call it, basically exploits, um, is, will be required to be enacted by all of the, uh, the member states uh, in short order. And this provision prohibits the production, sale, procurement for use, import, distribution uh, of, these, of these tools that, are, that could be used to commit these enumerated offenses, which is pretty much all the, all the bad things that you can think of doing with a computer. However, there's an exception. It's a very important exception. Uh, for tools that are created for legitimate purposes, such as to test the reliability of systems, uh, and it further notes that there needs to be, in order to violate this law, you need to have a, you need to show a direct intent that the tools be used to commit some of the offenses. Uh, so in both cases, both in the U.S. and in Europe, we're seeing this, this trend. Well, this, it's really going back to the definitional problem. How do we define what an exploit is and, and how do we make sure that, you know, legitimate tools are, are can, can still be bought and sold. So 
this is kind of perspective. We don't know what the laws are actually going to look like. But I would start thinking like this. Think about dual use tools. I mean, if you write something, don't put it together as the next greatest hack. You know, this is a, you're creating pen testing tools. Uh, you've just, this has gone on for a long time. If you look at uh, software, I'm sure you've all used it. Uh, Copy 2 Plus on the Apple II, anybody? Uh, or Locksmith? Uh, you know, backup software. And the, the, the manuals for these softwares have these very elaborate disclaimers how this is strictly being used to back up your floppy. This is not being used uh, to make illegal copies. And that is really the conundrum and I think that's where, that's where software, that's where exploits will go uh, and it's the ex some, some exploits will never be able to be uh, looked at as a dual use tool for sure. I mean if, if all, if you know, if you know sort of like a, if you have a nuclear missile equivalent of an exploit, I mean it's hard to justify uh, the pen testing uh, value of that. Uh, but for a lot of tools, um, they will fall into, into this area and that's just where perhaps they should go. Um, some other things you might do if you, if you are selling, um, know your buyer to the extent you can. Um, I think regulation is just one bad outcome away. What's going to happen is someone in the U.S. is going to sell an exploit, it's going to go through some channel, and it's going to come back and get used against some U.S. interest. We may not hear about it. It may be, it may be a matter of, uh, you know, maybe secret. Uh, but this will happen. And then there will be a huge drive to stop this from happening very quickly. Um, it's the same reason, you know, as soon as, you know, if someone is uh, murdered with a certain type of weapon, that weapon has to be banned, that's going to happen here. It's the laws are, the way laws are created in this country is very reactionary. And I expect that trend to continue here. Uh, so maybe you can prevent that from happening. Um, <laughs> so know your buyer. Uh, if you're selling something, don't sell into a channel where it's likely to go to some country that's under an embargo with the, with the United States. Maybe your best bet is just to sell it to the U.S. <laughs> um, ask for assurances from your buyer. Uh, so you don't have knowledge that it's going to uh, someplace where it's not supposed to go. Uh, you know, you could be lied to, but you can't control, you know, everything, right? But at least you can get an assurance that you're, you know, it's, it's not going to be used in some illegitimate way. Uh, and also you can always use disclaimer language. So I have some, some nice examples of disclaimer language here. Um, this, this huge chunk of text on the top is actually from a software product that many of you have probably used many times. It's good stuff. I've highlighted probably the, the best of the operative language in it. But if you're selling something, be sure to use some disclaimer language about uh, that, that kind of flows along these lines that would help you from uh, being charged with being complicit in any sort of illegal use to which the software might eventually be put. Uh, and lastly, I'd just like to highlight this bottom little paragraph, which is actually from the Apple uh, iTunes Store. It's the end user license agreement that, that comes with that. And it requires that you agree that you will not use these products for any purpose prohibited by United States law, including without limitation, the development, design, manufacture, production of nuclear missiles or <laughs> chemical or biological weapons. <laughs> Thank God. Words with friends. That is dangerous stuff. Uh, so thank you for thank you for coming. This is my contact block. So we, I think we have some we have some time here for questions. So if people want to line up, I'm happy to entertain them as best we can. There, there are definitely free speech issues, um, especially in the temporary restraining order context. Oh, Second Amendment, sorry. Second Amendment challenge? They come see me after about that. Question back here. Question? Let's connect on that. Let's connect on that. Yeah. So what about what about using a, a corporation to limit your liability for disclosure or uh, or selling? Is that has that been utilized? Uh, corporations can be held liable in many cases. The com in fact, even under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, it hasn't happened yet, but a corporation could be held liable. 
done. There you go. Hi. Uh, question regarding full disclosure versus responsible disclosure. So when we do it, we do it via responsible disclosure. We contact the vendor, we give them 30 days, and we tell them our, our intent to publish, and we publish everything. So the actual vulnerability and how to do it so that people can replicate and do whatever they want. In most cases, the vendors um, get a hot fix within, within a week, and then if within 30 days they, they provide the hotfix, then we spread them and say, you know, to fix it, install hotfix, whatever. Sometimes vendors will say, um, we need more time, um, maybe we'll negotiate a couple of days, but sometimes they'll say, we're not going to fix it and you can't publish it. So I won't explain what we do for that. But um, Google recently published uh, the fact that um, they plan to disclose vulnerabilities within seven days. Right to have a seven-day turnaround. So what happens if a company like Google, uh, I don't want to use the word threaten, but uh, intends to publish a vulnerability within the seven-day turnaround period, and that company says to Google, don't, if you do, we'll sue you. What happens in Google versus that vendor company? Well, Google is at risk if Google has some kind of obligation not to. I mean, if... Um, you, it, it would depend on the specific circumstances of it, yeah. uh, but in this case, I mean, if, if no law has been broken, then Google could e publish that without any but in, the, in the case for me, for example, where I contact a vendor and I say, I've got the following 10 vulnerabilities which I plan to publish, and they come back to me and say, if you publish those, we'll sue you, right? Yeah. And the same thing happens when Google say, well, we're not going to give you 30 days, we're going to give you seven days, and the company comes back and says, Google, we're going to sue you if, you if you publish. It doesn't carry the same weight where they're trying to sue Google as they're trying to sue me, for example. I mean, that helps as well, man. I mean, that's the unfortunate part. I mean, as, yeah. as, as a But is it just a case of, of, of how good your legal team is? Or how, how expensive your legal team exactly. is? Exactly. How much exactly. do you charge? <laughs> <laughs> where do you want to meet them at? Oh, let's, let's go. Sorry, I don't know. Okay. Where's good? Yeah, good. Where, 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 oh, sorry. You want to meet them, Matt, to carry on because there's about five or six other people. Let's go in the hall. Yeah. So this talk's over with. Uh, we've got to get it ready for the evening. Uh, now in the hallway, he'll answer the rest of your questions. Unfortunately, there's not a Q and A because it's been dissimilar too. So thank y'all.